All right, that's a working mic. Okay, so I'm the start of the day today. That's, that's good. Uh, we're going to talk about RDMA, debugging and diagnostics. And you can see we've got the, our new Mellanox logo celebrating 20 years of Mellanoxiness, and a lot of them were spent at this workshop, so it's been a long time. Uh, the interesting thing about our little space, this RDMA space in the kernel, is there's an awful lot of available information for debugging, but it's been sort of sprinkled across the kernel all over the place. There's, there's places in SysFS, there's stuff in the Ethernet stack, there's stuff in DebugFS on some of the drivers. So we've been undergoing some consolidation here and trying to bring this into a consistent interface where maybe it's easy to discover what's debuggable, what's available, and, and adding some more features along the way. And the general sort of theme here is this, this idea of monitor your fabric, inspect your applications, and then de debug your problems. Because um, we don't want to, you know, RDMA is sufficiently complicated, we often have problems that, that kind of need analysis. And I think as we've heard a couple times today, we have a, a whole bunch of different protocols in the RDMA world. Um, and they all have kind of different takes on this. So like IB led the way, a long time ago with this idea of a centralized management and centralized performance managers and, and um, the ability to inspect your fabric from the end nodes is pretty key in IB. And I think OPA has something very similar, but most of the other things don't, particularly things based on ethernet tend to be in an ethernet world where, you know, maybe your switch is part of a fabric with a unified management, or maybe it's just a switch. It's, it's really up to something that's not standardized. And again, different sets of tools, you know, SN, SNNP and, and related are very popular in Ethernet, but they're not really integrated with RDMA. So RDMA has its own set of stuff and you can't really access it through the Ethernet world. But what we'd like is to get to a point where all of the protocols in RDMA's family kind of have a consistent experience for the debug experience on the node. So you can expect to that the same commands will work for, for all, of your, you know, all of your cases. So we'll start by taking a, a quick look at counters. Counters are probably the most important and most useful debugging tool when it comes to RDMA. Uh, in part, this is because of the high performance of RDMA. Most other debugging tools are very intrusive, whereas counters are very, very low cost, and you can glean quite a bit of information from your counters about what might be happening particularly the error counters are very definitive that something is going wrong. So we have saw, I think yesterday there were quite a few presentations about collecting the counters and aggregating them and visualizing them and, and integrating them. So this, this is more about where do the counters come from, how do you access them, and, and uh, what kind of counters you might, might find available. So when we're looking at the Ethernet-based protocols in, in RDMA, we tend to have the Ethernet counters out in the Ethernet world, so using tools like ETHTOOL and maybe IP Link and maybe some of the SysFS counters to access them. Uh, on InfiniBand, you're looking at things like PerfQuery, and now we're getting into these per object counters, which I'll, I'll talk about later. So, you know, your basic Ethernet counters that you'd see on a protocol like Rocky, probably also. Um, iWarp is, you know, your standard MIB, comes with IP Link Show, very, very basic not actually terribly useful. I think these error counters of drops and overruns, they don't actually apply to RDMA. And if I remember correctly, they don't even work on modern Ethernet because we don't have errors like those anymore. Uh, but the really interesting stuff is in the ETH tool side where you get to see the counters that the driver thought were important. So these, there's a very long list. I had to truncate it to make it fit on the slide. Um, this is a, from a Mellanox driver. The list is very, very long. It's full of all kinds of interesting counters that are really relevant in, in a very different way than the sort of standard counters. And these counters tend to be more applicable to RDMA traffic, like the, the packets and the bytes and um, things are relevant. Some of the counters here I've quoted, like TSO and LRO, are only relevant to the net stack side, but some of them, some of the other counters that I've truncated have application to the, the RDMA part as well. I think everyone here should be pretty familiar with uh, perf query counters. You know, this is just your basic one. You can access them either using perf query or in our stack, you can 
see them through that Sisyphus path I've listed there. The, they're kind of useless in a sense that the way we've defined them in Sisyphus means that the counters track the perf query counter. So when your performance manager on your network goes and resets them, your Sisyphus counters get reset as well, which basically makes them completely useless since you can't tell when they're going to be reset. You, can't, you don't have any basis for when they're counting. Um, then we have kind of the analog to the ETH2 counters in the RDMA world. We have RDMA driver specific counters which are available in this hardware counters directory under the port. So this would be instead of slash one slash counters, it's uh, one slash hardware counters. Uh, I think this is again a Mellanox. There's a, quite a few of them. And these are all relevant to RDMA. So you can see there's a variety of error counters. In fact, I think a, a big number of them tend to be error counters. And of course, the error counters indicate something that's definitively gone wrong and, and probably need to be investigated. And we're starting to talk about making specifically these counters come out with the RDMA statistics command. And these counters do not have the problem that the, the previous ones did about the resetting. So they, you know, they're under control of the software, of the kernel. They don't get reset by an external entity. We can expose them through RDMA statistics and they can actually be a useful part of it and, and, and become discoverable to users. So this is a new command. I think it was just merged, I don't know, last couple months, this is work that Steve Wise and Leon Romanowski have done together. Uh, and we're starting to see more adoption. I think I saw patches for the HNS driver to enable them. The uh, CXGB4 driver has them enabled. Uh, I think some things might be coming for MLX drivers down the road. But the statistics command is intended to be the gateway for all of these kind of counter access requirements. So all of the counters I listed in the previous slide there's kind of a long-term vision where we'd like to see them exposed through RDMA statistics. Um, there aren't patches for that just yet, but that's kind of the, the long-term plan here. Um, I don't know how we'll solve the, the perf query problem, but presumably we'll think of something. Uh, again, it will probably depend on the drivers. A lot of this is going to depend on having the drivers uh, bring in support for this. But it would presumably obviate the need to access SysFS files to read the counters. The new project that we're starting to see, uh, I think patches for this may come out in the, you know, the next couple of months, is something called on-demand counters. And this is the idea where you can have a resource like a process running a queue pair, and you want to narrow your view just to that queue pair, and you want to see what's going on. How many bytes is it transmitted? Has it experienced any errors that are notable? So you can request that the RDMA stack and the underlying hardware give you counters for that resource with this bind command. These are um, sort of preliminary APIs for, for user space. We'll see what they look like when they get merged. And then you can view the counters for that QP with a, a show command. Um, this is something that would be very useful when working with large scale MPI systems or, or otherwise where you might have you know, you might see that there's a problem with one specific thing and you really want to look into it and, and get rid of all of the other traffic because the other traffic clouds the ability of counters to supply you with information. Uh, I think this is actually something Bob asked for, so I'm not sure where Bob went, but it's uh, coming, hopefully. Again, forward-looking statements, we can't be too, too uh, specific here. But, as I said, the statistics should, should all come into there. Now, RDMA tool originally started as a way to, to look at what objects are in the system. So it's intended to, it started out as being a way to um, kind of duplicate things like IP link and SS, except with the RDMA information integrated into them. And it's grown lately, and we now can see pretty much all of the major objects that compose the RDMA subsystem. So you can have visibility into how many QPs your processes are using, or MRs and QPs and contexts and, and all of these things. So there's now filtering languages. You can see what processes have what. So it's, it's really taken on a, a flavor that combines it with uh, the capability you might have had with SS or LSOF. And this is very useful for, for seeing what your processes are doing, doing kind of debugging. If you're not really super familiar with what the, the programs you're debugging are actually doing, now you can actually see what kind of resources they're displaying. And 
Um, a lot of effort has now been put into the, the device link and port reporting, so you can do um, RDMA commands to see the, the link status, the port status, what devices are present. You can now have RDMA commands to add new devices. We have RDMA tool commands that add um, RxE and in future soft iWarp devices to the system instead of the old method, which was done with horrible scripts in Perl. And it sort of harmonizes with the existing dev info and, and provides that missing glue that we had where you couldn't really see without kind of slepping through SysFS how this all fit together. So now you can see that an RDMA device is connected to a specific net device because it's a, it's a Rocky device or an iWarp device. And you can associate that then over into the verbs world with IBV dev info to make a, like the full linkage where you know, my MLX0 or RxE0 device is connected to ETH0, which is its physical port. And this has been kind of a, an annoying missing gap for a while. We still haven't really aggregated the physical link information. This is stuff that in Ethernet you might see at ETH tool. You run ETH tool, it tells you information about the PHY, it tells you what the link speed is, it gives you all of those details. That has not been mirrored into the RDMA side, and it hasn't been mirrored into the uh, dev info or any of those things. You get some kind of overview where most of the drivers translate their Ethernet link state into the kind of the ID language of a, a width and a speed and a up and a down but it's a kind of a rough translation and it loses a lot of the detail that's available from the Ethernet Phi. I'm not sure we're going to tackle that problem. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of interest. The information is really available with ETHTool and other things. And it's, it's fairly comprehensive, so I think we're going to leave that off on the side. Uh, another new feature that's come in the last uh, approximately year is the ability for the drivers to supply information, and this is not intended to be counter information, but just information from the driver about the object. So this is from an HNS device, and it's showing you that there's debugging information for their uh, CQ. So we've got some of their internal driver data visible here in the debugging output, and this can help diagnose driver problems. Um, you know, if your driver gets into a weird state, this debugging information can, can really help you. And I'm, I don't know much about exactly what they're debugging here with the HNS, but it looks interesting. Most of the numbers are zero. I assume that's good. Uh, don't know. We're seeing this starting to roll up. So today, I think only HNS and CXGB4 implement any counters or any of this information at all. Uh, but I am optimistic that we'll start to see more drivers bring this in because it is, a, it is, it is very useful. Um, but I think this attachment is possible for all of the objects. Um, there's driver callbacks and, and so forth that you can hook in to, to expose this. Now, this is intended for information that's not of accounting nature. Counting objects should go through the statistics interface, like the kind of are today with the hardware counters directory, uh, so that we want to keep the counters kind of separate. Uh, hopefully in future we'll have, you know, more robust ways to work with the counters and control when they get zeroed and, and, and so things, things like that. So this is something new that's really also come up with the RDMA tools. We now have analogs to the tools that are kind of traditional in the IP world, like NetStat-A. I'm, I'm sure all of you have run that at some point to see what are the TCP connections on my system, what open ports do I have. So we can now get that similar information with the RDMA tool. You can look at the CMIDs, which is approximately equivalent to a listening socket or an open port on your system and you can get some idea what daemons are running or, or what things are exposed to the outside world so at least you can at least you can attempt to start to do a security audit um, without having to actually inspect the applications this is I, I think a big gain and we can see the established concept it's a little different here you have to associate the CMIDs with the QP and you might have to do this manually. I don't think it's quite been fully harmonized yet, but uh, the long-term deal is that we, we hope that it'll become very obvious to see which is uh, a listening CMID and which has become an established CMID, and which, which Q pairs it's associated with, very much like you see in, in the socket world. And we're also including PID data, so this is incorporating what you'd get from LSOF. And it's very useful information. And 
This is perhaps an area that a lot of people may not be familiar with, but it's very, very useful. So the kernel has something called dynamic debugging, and a lot of our drivers have uh, a copious amount of debugging prints. Uh, but they're hidden by default. Uh, this is the instructions here from the kernel documentation, how to use the dynamic debugging to turn those prints back on. So if you're having a peculiar problem with verbs, or maybe you're getting a system call, you're trying to create an object and you're just getting E and val or, or something like that, you can turn this on and there's a pretty good chance that somebody's put a print in an error path in a driver in the core code that will give you some additional indication of what's gone wrong. And I think Gal here has been saying he might take up the mantle to make this a little bit more standardized within the RDMA core. So we might have uh, a future where we have kernel APIs that are even perhaps more accessible than this or perhaps more rigorous so that you can have a, a broader expectation of you know, where drivers should put these prints and what kind of information they can convey. The other really useful kernel tool is kernel ftrace and kernel ftrace lets you really look at the control flow in the kernel dynamically without recompiling it. So if your verbs application, again, is failing in a peculiar way, you can reach to strace and you can put instrumentation along the, the call path in the drivers and in the core code and start to see, you know, where did my error code come from or where did things go wrong or, or what path am I taking in the kernel if I'm seeing a performance problem. And again, this is all dynamic. You don't have to recompile your kernel. You, you can just enable it using the tools that are available and that, and that article has a fairly decent description of how it works and, and how to use it, but this is uh, perhaps a, a much more advanced tool that you need to have more knowledge about the kernel functionality and, and how the kernel elements work to really get good value out of it. But it's, I think, an often overlooked thing when you're debugging a live system. You need more information than you can get just out of something like counters, but without recompiling the kernel because that's, that's too difficult on an operating environment. So I think the kind of final topic here is performance. Um, obviously RDMA is very performance focused and a lot of people are deploying it in situations where not meeting the performance goals is basically a defect that needs to be fixed. Um, Ethernet is not often in that world, you know, you're often just happy if your TCP connections work. It's not it's not obviously the Ethernet world where the performance bounds should be, but with RDMA, you should expect to be able to get more or less wire speed in most cases. So if you're not, you might need to do some investigating. Um, so we have a variety of tools that you can do to test the network itself. Um, bandwidth latency, perf test does all kinds of interesting things. Many applications like the MPIs, they have their own testing suites that you can run to give you some idea what's going on. And this can be very useful to tell if your physical network, if your switches, if your fabric, if they're performing the way they're expected, especially in Ethernet where you often need to configure your switches in certain ways to get the peak performance. And you know the best practice is to run these testing tools, combine them with counter collection, look for counters that have errors, look in your switches for errors, you know, look at your files for errors and, and make sure that everything is really clean. Uh, a lot of sites will do this in their kind of an HPC context before they pass their you know, newly deployed hardware off to users. Make sure the hardware is working correctly. These are all traditional tools. I don't think we've seen any real development in the last little while to make these more, more anything. PerfTest in particular seems to be lacking a little bit these days. It might need a little bit of maintenance love if anybody's interested. And packet capture is very popular in Ethernet. You often find Ethernet problems solved by capturing packets, looking at the TCP flows, and trying to, trying to guess what's going on. There's a whole host of tools for doing that. When you start to talk about RDMA, it gets a little bit more fuzzy. Some of the drivers do have integration with TCP dump and Wireshark, so you can just run them, and then you can see RDMA traffic. Uh, that's done with special integration, it has to be specially requested, but a lot of our hardware just has no way to inspect the raw traffic at all, just period. It, it bypasses the network stack, it bypasses all of the channels in the device that might let you capture it. So there really is very limited ways to look at it, and you're, you're off into sort of adventures in networking where you, maybe you're going to use a mirror port if you want to look at your traffic, or an optical splitter on a SFP cable. 
try and get the traffic out. This is starting to become very, very invasive. Uh, hopefully more people will implement the, the dumping APIs and verbs, the flow steering, it's done with flow steering uh, in libpcap, but I think currently that's limited to Mellanox hardware and only some Mellanox hardware at that. Um, but capture is something you reach for when you're having really difficult problems because if you're running capture on the same node that you're running your application, it's going to have a significant impact on performance. Capturing a 100 or 200 gigabit stream is, is very, very difficult. Um, if you really want to do it without any loss, you, you pretty much need dedicated hardware just to do the capturing uh, because these are very, very high speeds. They're starting to exceed even the, the, the bandwidth of the PCI Express and most, ser most servers. So, yeah. I'm not sure how useful it, it turns out for real performance problems. I view Capture as more of a, a tool to aid developers who are writing drivers or writing applications who can narrow their traffic flow and um, analyze it with a Capture and make sure that they're getting the packets that they've kind of designed it for. So a little bit of an overview of kind of the tools that you can reach for in this space. Uh, the one that I didn't talk about because I'm not super familiar with is LLDP tool and DCB tool, those are needed to configure the, the, the interaction of the NIC with the switches for the DCB protocol and DCB is part of making rocky networks lossless, so it's something that you often need to touch. But I think a lot of these should be familiar to everyone in the room. I'm, I, uh, yeah. My only advice when, when talking about these tools is to the people really, you know, you know, we're in what, 2019 now? People really should be using the IP link tool, the IP set of tools. They shouldn't be using the legacy tools like route or ifconfig or netstat. All those tools have been obsolete for a very long time. Like, they don't even work correctly with uh, things like IP over IP links. They, they have defects. Um, it really is time that everyone learned the new tools. IP and RDMA is inspired by IP. It has the same command interface, so it's very uh, natural if you're familiar with the IP way of doing things, the net tools, IP tools way of doing things. So, and sort of my final sl slide here is to, to give some advice on, on debugging, because I've seen people approach this in different ways, and not always it comes out the way that you want. So uh, debugging with these kind of indirect low touch methods like counters is, is kind of difficult. You don't necessarily know, it's not, it's not as direct as, you know, oh, I saw my application crash, oh, well, I really know what's happening. It's often statistical. Maybe you see a counter event only, you know, one time out of a hundred. So you have to be kind of very rigorous. If you, if you see an event, you need to make a hypothesis, then you need to find some way to test that hypothesis, and then you do your test. And, you do it over a long time period. You, you, you work with statistical kind of time periods to make sure that the test is not just a false negative or a false positive. And you really do need to test your hypothesis in multiple different ways. It's, it's not necessarily sufficient to say, oh, I made this change and everything got better, therefore, you know, I can conclude that this caused that and this is the fix and I need to roll it out, I've seen. You know, that, that kind of leads to very strange things, very strange pieces of uh, decision making, um, which then makes it very hard to actually fix the problem. So if you've done something that reduces the frequency, that's great. It might help you get your system operating. But when we're talking about HPC scales, when you have hundreds of thousands of nodes and cables, NICs and switches, uh, the probability that a low probability thing happens to you the time scale becomes really short. Maybe every day you see a, a statistical problem that you haven't fully solved because you, you haven't been able to understand what it is. So my advice is to be very rigorous, follow the scientific method, and work on your uh, hypothesis really carefully. And that concludes my slides today. So keeping us on time. Does anyone have any questions, Tom? Oh, well, let, let's... Y yes, please, if you can. Sure, I have one. Tom, Tom Telpe, Microsoft. Um, it's good stuff, but a lot of it seems really low level. It seems like the sort of thing that a driver developer would want. Yep. But what about an application? I mean, do you have feedback from applications, what statistics they need to 
figure out what's going on and tune, and in particular, kernel applications like storage uh, subsystems? So I am, we're always looking for new things to help debug. But I think the challenge is, is all of these, for instance, the counters in particular have to be run in the hardware and have to run at a hardware speed. Well, yeah, there are but, but limits. But the, the sysadmin or the application admin has a different view of the world than the driver developer. Right. Right. And they may want to know, you know, how well am I using RDMA? Not just what link errors did I get, which is usually noise, right? Honestly. It, it's important. If it's happening, you should look into it. Yes. But, you know, you don't expect it in normal operation. And it's noise. You want to know how many RDMA writes did I use relative to sends and receives, for instance. So with this new really high level stuff. Yeah. That's not driver dependent and not sure. hardware dependent. So with this new ability to have per object counters, like for a single QP. Yeah, that's where I lit up where you said I could zoom in yeah. on a CQ. So on, today on a QP route. Yeah. Today, at least in the, the only implementation that, that I'm aware of, those counters are limited to counters that pre exist. But now that we have the mechanism, you could certainly imagine that now a driver could provide more useful counters. Like, how many RDMA writes did I do? How many reads did I do? How many sends did I do on this QP? Yeah, you could define a driver MIB that all drivers have to support, right? Yes, it could be. That's what uh, I want to hear you say, but you didn't say it, so that's what yes. I'm trying to I, I'm not, I'm, My job isn't to be prescriptive and say, you know, you have to support these things, right? Yeah. So we're providing channels. Uh, it would be, you know, a reasonable role of something like the OFA or the IBTA or the IETF to give prescriptive guidance to say, you know, this is what administrative debugging people need. This is the kind of counters you must provide. And here's the definitions for what the counters are. Okay. Right? Because today it's a Wild West world. We have counters that are defined by the IBA, TA, some for them the IETF, and then this huge gulf where the driver people have said, that's not nearly enough. I'm going to put my own counters in and definitions for them depend yeah, on the well, driver, that's, right? That's fine. Well, it, it is to a point, but it well, means that I can't. Yeah, but it doesn't replace the requirement at no. the top. Yeah. No, so we should, you know, it's a good idea. And it is, maybe it's good advice for the, the working group that I heard um, Jim say is, is forthcoming to work on administration. Yeah, hopefully. Could be. Maybe they could say, give some guidance to yeah. our drivers. So Particularly the requirements of the upper layers. I think that's yeah. what's important. Well, I think, as you say, as you get more specific, you can get more information. Like, I, I would like to see counters related to an MR. How many, how many bytes of traffic went in and out of that MR? You know, that's... Maybe not useful for something like NVMe, but for an MPI, maybe it's super useful. Uh, particularly when we're talking about MRs with more performance characteristics, like when we have an ODP MNR, it becomes very interesting to know how many page faults has that MR hit, you know, how many times has it stalled, maybe even a latency histogram or something. You know, there's a lot of things we can do with this new, this new interface, and I think you know, I, I would like to be optimistic that the driver people will develop more capabilities to go down this channel as time goes on. Bernard. Just a, just a quick question. Uh, where do you think would the um, device uh, private parameter setting fit in that picture? Because, so, uh, for, for example, for soft driver, you, 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 you may set on or off the CRC or may select a certain MPA version or something like that. So we haven't really tackled that question yet. And in the existing devices that we have, device private parameter setting has been a somewhat fragmented. Sometimes you see it, and this is discouraged, sometimes you'll see settings in SysFS. But what's become really popular now is DevLink. And I don't think DevLink is applicable to soft eye warp, really. Yeah. Uh, so we'll see a lot of tunable parameters done through the DevLink interface, which has kind of a very generic um, method for drivers to define their own parameters. And then you see a little bit done through kind of the IP tool suite as well for the Ethernet side of the world. Would it, would it maybe make, make sense to extend the, the RDMA tools for that? I think it does. It has a nice mirror to the Ethernet side, which does this through IP and ETH tool. Yeah. So I think you can propose that. Yeah. Um, I, w I would suggest to get soft eyewear merged first and then yeah, yeah, worry sure, about sure. the but tunables. But, but get rid of many module parameters. Yeah, module parameters are definitely and, discouraged. And, and that, it's, it's all gone, but I could make happen for, for tuning and selecting. So I just have one version which is doing something which is maybe not, not optimal in all cases. Right. Right, right. Mm -hmm. the, the other possibility for something like soft eyewear is when we do the RDMA link add command. Um, you can have more stuff. 
passed into the driver. And I think this already happens in the net dev side as, a, a, as an example. It could be something like per QP, right? You, you, you could say you have a peer which, which is MPA version something oh. and you want to switch to that for, for that one connection. Right? Yeah, that, that's, that's starting, yeah. You know, maybe that's necessary for, for performance, but that's starting to become like the, a fine grain tuning that's um, maybe a slightly different topic. Like, like so, so at least I think there are some common parameters for all drivers of a certain transport, right? And that would, would be like maybe the, the first step of, of an extension. Yeah, if there's common parameters. I think like in Rocky, for instance, we have a, um, some common parameters involving the way Rocky V1 or V2 is right. selected, how the kid table, if you want to enable them. There's a whole sort of things. I imagine iWarp is similar. Um, we can certainly start there by exposing them through RDMA tool in a standard way. And even the kind of the driver specific ones, like with, with Soft RWARP and RxC, when you create the link, you could specify things like your CRC example. Yeah. You know, this link is created with the CRC uh, disabled or however, you know, however that choice works. Um, and that's reasonable. And I think we already have most of the infrastructure for that. It's just uh, a little bit of user space to parse the, yeah. the strings and whatnot. But. Okay, thanks. All right, uh, I see, yes, question, Michael. One, one, one final question. Oh, okay. one final question, okay. I'm gonna push on what they were both talking about. There seems like um, when you go through like some tab library or whatever, there's, there's a common list of uh, like congestion, uh, link quality and stuff like that. It right. seems like it's inconsistent from one vendor to another. When so when you're talking about the MADs, the MADs are all standardized by IBTA, and every single MAD, if you go in the IBTA spec, all of those counters have a, a lengthy, well, they have a description about what they're supposed to count. It's not, it's not always a great description, but if you think that vendors are implementing those counters inconsistently, yes. that would be something to, you know, first of all, if it's really obvious, you can complain to your vendor that they're not following the spec, because there is a spec for those counters. And if the, you know, if, if the spec is ambiguous, then this is when it would be appropriate to raise it to the IBTA, the management working group, and say, look, your spec for this counter is not ambiguous. Can you make a, a, an errata? And then you know, encourage your vendors to conform to the spec. And maybe, you know, this isn't an IBTA conference, but uh, interrupt testing for IBTA topics arguably should cover conformance to the spec for counters and all of these things, because there's a lot of details in counters. Uh, especially if you're having pain where you're seeing that the counters are not working correctly. Um, that's a, it's probably not the answer you wanted to hear, but that's... Exactly what I wanted to hear. Okay, so there's some guidance on how you might try and address it, I guess, Mike. Okay. Thank you.